So this is just a quickie between longer videos, I mean, videos, get your mind off the gutter. <laughs> okay, today's topic is why, why do narcissists encourage their partners to be unfaithful? A substantial minority of narcissists encourage their partners, proactively encourage them to sleep with others to have sex with others, to be unfaithful via casual sex, swinging or group sex, especially threesomes. Now, in reality, half of all narcissists are women and half are men. This is the situation today. It's been very different 40 years ago, but we have evolved and progressed since then, and women became equal to men, even in this unfortunate uh, arena. But when it comes to this kind of behavior, asking your intimate partner or encouraging your intimate partner to have sex with others, the um, most of the narcissists who do this, they are actually men. Very few women narcissists do this. Now, the victims often misinterpret the narcissist's encouragement as his wish or his command. They seek to gratify the narcissist by acquiescing, to please the narcissist, to make him happy, to preserve the couple, to introduce some spice into a dying relationship, sexually at least. So victims collude and collaborate in this dance macabre, although this is usually based on a total misinterpretation of the narcissist's motivations for this kind of exceedingly rare and bizarre behavior. I mean, I don't know of, of many guys who would do this, and it's, it's, it's strange. Now, some of you might say, it's not strange at, it's, at all, it's cuckoldry. Cuckoldry is a fetish. It's a sexual practice. It's a form of kink. And about 1% to 3% of the, of the male population are cuckolds and a much smaller number of women are queens. So there are people who derive sexual arousal and pleasure by witnessing their intimate partners having sex with others, or by being aware of their intimate partners having sex with others. This is cuckoldry. Cuckoldry, as I said, is a fetish. It's a form of masochism. The cuckold derives pleasure from being humiliated. In his book, Masochism and the Self, Roy Bau Baumeister, a prominent uh, psychologist, advanced a self-theory analysis. He said that cuckolding is a form of escaping from self-awareness. Self-awareness becomes intolerable and uh, burdensome. There's a perception, self-perception of inadequacy, a bad object. I'm unworthy, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, and the physical and mental pain from masochism and cuckoldry in this case uh, takes attention away from the bad object, from these voices, tormenting voices inside the mind which keep telling you that you are a zero, you are a failure, you are a loser, you are good for nothing, etc. etc. So the masochism is like a pain that takes your mind away. It's a form of self-harming. Self-harming is very common in borderline personality disorder. And um, Baumeister says it brings attention away from the self, which is desirable in times of guilt, anxiety, or insecurity, or when self-awareness is unpleasant. Immediately you can see that this does not apply to narcissists. Even covert narcissists rarely experience guilt or shame uh, consciously. They rarely do this. And so narcissists, who encourage their partners to um, have sex with other people are not, in the vast majority of cases, are not cuckolds. They are not masochists. To characterize them as cuckolds and masochists is to misunderstand narcissism profoundly. Narcissism is a defense against shame. It's a repression of these emotions. It's an obliteration of the bad object via comp compensatory grandiosity. Cuckoldry is exactly the opposite. It's getting in touch with the shame. 
It's experiencing humiliation, <laughs> seeking mortification. That's not narcissism. So why do narcissists behave exactly as cuckolds do? Number one, betrayal fantasy. The betrayal fantasy is a very crucial element in the devaluation discard part of the narcissistic cycle of relationship. The narcissist needs to devalue the partner and discard the partner by shifting the blame. The narcissist would encourage his partner to betray him, to cheat on him, so that he can feel blameless and guiltless when devaluing and discarding her. I have a video dedicated to betrayal fantasy. It's titled, How Narcissist Betrays You to Become Himself. And that sums it up. The narcissist um, encourages you to misbehave, to betray him and to cheat on him, so that he can, with good conscience, dump you. And dumping is the symbolic representation of separation individuation the unresolved stage or phase in early childhood development with his original mother. You are a maternal object and he needs to get rid of you in order to reenact the early conflict with his mother. The best way to do this is if you were to cheat on him with someone else, then he would feel utterly, utterly exonerated and utterly justified in telling you uh, goodbye. So this is the first and major reason. Second one, loyalty test. The narcissist converts you into a maternal figure and expects, expects you to accept him, to embrace him and to love him unconditionally as a mother would. But how, how can the narcissist trust you? How, do, how would he know that you are trustworthy, that you can be relied upon, that you will not betray him and cheat on him or that you will not hurt him the way his original mother did, that you will not become absent, that you will not become neglectful, that you will not become rageful, that you will not become vindictive. How can the narcissist verify all this? By baiting you. The narcissist baits you. He puts you to a loyalty test with other, other potential partners. And then if you fail the loyalty test, he devalues you and discards you because you are not a good mother. You are a dead mother, exactly like his original mother. His original mother has, betray has betrayed him. His original mother has abandoned him. His original mother has cheated on him with her husband or father. And you're doing the same. So it's a loyalty test. Next, it's a dare, especially if you're prone to triangulation. If you're the narcissist's intimate partner, and the only way to get a rise out of him is to triangulate with other people, the narcissist would dare you. The narcissist, remember, is defiant. The narcissist is reckless. And so he would dare you. He would, he would say, see if I care. It's a power play. You start to triangulate. The narcissist pushes you to consummate the uh, relationship with the, the third party. That is the Kaufman drama triangle. You come to the narcissist with a newly found rescuer and savior. The narcissist tells you, Go to that rescuer and savior. Have sex with your rescuer and savior. I dare you. See if I care. I couldn't care less about you. It's a power play. Of course, it's not true. Deep inside, the narcissist is as tormented as anyone would be by your, um, by your infidelity, by your lack of faithfulness. Next, the narcissist would encourage you to have sex with others in order to uphold uphold this view of the other sex as untrustworthy and whorish. Now, narcissistic women are misandrists. They hate men and they regard men as untrustworthy and whorish. Narcissistic men are misogynists. They hate women and they regard women as untrustworthy and whorish. And what better way to validate their point of view by witnessing your infidelity, your cheating, your deception. So the narcissist encourages you to conform to his snapshot of you, to his perception of you. He perceives you as whorish, untrustworthy, impulse 
uh, having problems with impulse control, impulsive and um, hurtful. And he wants you to conform to this view. He wants to feel validated. He wants to feel that he is right. He's not just de deluding himself or hallucinating. And so when you go away with another man and sleep with him, you will have validated and confirmed and affirmed and buttressed the narcissist's view of you as a representative of your gender and of the other sex, generally speaking. And finally, there is sadism. Sadism is when the narcissist seeks to defile the partner, to humiliate her, to degrade her by witnessing her debauchery and self-prostitution. Now, this applies to women as well. I will reread the sentence from the female narcissist point of view. The narcissist seeks to defile the partner by witnessing his debauchery and self-prostitution and promiscuity. So it's a form of sadism. Encouraging you to sleep with someone else is the narcissist's way of hurting you, of telling you, you mean nothing to me. You're dispensable. You're interchangeable. I want to get rid of you. I want you gone. Um, and so it's very hurtful, very painful. It is the narcissist's way of reasserting control over a situation that is clearly out of control, over a relationship that is going downhill and accelerating and can no longer be managed, is not manageable. So what the narcissist does, he legitimizes, he consents to his partner's misbehavior, thereby saying, I'm actually complicit, I'm privy to this. It's done with my permission and my consent. I'm in charge. I'm in control. Everything is okay. My grandiosity is intact. I am still omnipotent. Of course, it is self-deception. The partner is liable to misbehave in ways which are unique to herself. She is not being manipulated or controlled by the narcissist. She's not being told why to, what to do. She's not being coerced. She is just reactive to the environment, the toxic environment that the narcissist had created. And so when the partner finds herself, finds herself on the path to this kind of solutions to the intractable, painful relationship, she no longer recognizes herself. She is estranged. She is disoriented. And this causes in her behaviors which are alien to her nature. But this is not induced by the narcissist. This is the partner's reaction to the narcissist. The, the psychodynamic is totally endogenous, totally internal, not external. Later on, the partner may regret what she had done and may reframe the entire experience as if she were coerced by the narcissist. The narcissist made her do it. This is, of course, an alloplastic defense. But the truth is, the narcissist creates a shared fantasy. The shared fantasy is onerous and difficult and harrowing and painful. And the partner who is somewhat dysregulated, somewhat damaged, somewhat broken, somewhat sensitive, somewhat susceptible, falls apart, disintegrates. And then dynamics and processes inside herself cause her to act in ways which shame her and make her feel guilty. And she doesn't know how to cope with these devastating, debilitating emotions. So she comes up with a narrative where she has been a hapless victim, a passive object, subject to manipulation and uh, lacking any willpower. That is, of course, expressly untrue. And it's a form of splitting. I'm all bad, the narcissist. I'm all good, the narcissist is all bad. 
to break your own boundaries, to behave in ways that you have never behaved before by defiling yourself, degrading yourself and humiliating yourself, essentially prostituting yourself. Um, now, there's no coercion involved. There's a misconception here. In none of the things that I've described is there coercion. The narcissist does not coerce his intimate partner to have sex with others. The narcissist doesn't pimp his intimate partner. The narcissist doesn't run um, a ring, <laughs> a sex ring, and this is not human trafficking. The narcissist simply goes with the flow. If the intimate partner triangulates, he encourage her, encourages her to carry it to the end. If the intimate partner seems to be unhappy, he then suggests to her to have sex with others. He baits her by introducing her to, to others and by leaving her alone with other men, for example, baiting her. He dares her as a power play and so on and so forth. It's much more subtle and nuanced and intricate than coercion. There's no coercion involved. There's a communication of expectations. There's a lot of hurt and pain in both parties. There is a power play. I think that's the most dominant feature. There's a power play involved. There is mutual testing. You know, how far will you go? Um, are you willing to hurt me? So these are very sick and dysfunctional dynamics, and they involve both the narcissist and his victim. This is not exclusive to the narcissist. And yet, this is not coercive. There's no coercion. And this is why the victim, having cheated on the narcissist, having been unfaithful, is devastated. Because she realizes that it has been her choice. She chose to do so. And she doesn't understand herself. She feels, she feels that she has acted in a way that is alien to her. She feels estranged. She feels that she is not herself. But this is not the outcome of coercion. It's the outcome of sick pathological dynamics, pathoetiology, as, as we call it. These dynamics can induce atypical behaviors in people involved in the couple. And that is true both for the narcissist and for the victim. Even the narcissist may engage in atypical behaviors. Boundaries are broken, rules are ignored, new, new behaviors emerge, there's imitation and emulation and modeling, there is merger and fusion. All these dynamics cause the victim to behave narcissistically because cheating on someone else, being unfaithful, going outside the remit of the vows one makes breaching exclusivity agreed upon. These are all narcissistic behaviors. And it is the victim who engages in them.